Hello, and welcome to this ICAEW webinar, A Practice Fit for the Future, Levering Technology to Boost Business Development in Association with Workbooks. My name is Nyla Khan, and I'm the Business Advice Manager here at ICAEW. I will be your facilitator for today's session. One of the challenges facing both business and practice today is sustainability. In a busy working environment, how can we keep track of leads, contacts and associates to generate long-term business relationships? CRM, or Client Relationship Management, is a digital solution to sustainable business development. We very much encourage you to get involved with today's webinar. You can submit your questions to us at any time by typing a question into the question box and pressing send. The questions will come straight to us without being sent to the rest of the audience. We've allowed time at the end for Q&A, so please keep them coming in. You can also use the question box to let us know about any issues regarding the technology and any difficulties you might be experiencing. We'll do our best to help with these. Please also take a note of the widgets, which you'll find at the bottom of your console. You can open and close these as needed. As well as sending in your questions, you can download a copy of the slides and find useful links under the resources widget. Our speakers today are James Oliphant from Workbooks and Colin Abercrombie from Inco Marketing, formerly French Duncan. James is an experienced account manager who understands the accountancy space and works closely with our clients to help their businesses evolve and grow. Prior to Workbooks, James worked at Insight UK, TDB Fusion and SSE. Colin is a chartered accountant with over 30 years experience in the profession. During this time, Colin built and sold the successful practice Abercrombie Gemmel before joining mid-tier firm French Duncan as a partner in 2014. Colin successfully embedded CRM systems in both practices, leading to significant operational efficiency and client relationship enhancements. So now, over to James and Duncan. Thank you very much. Before I go into before I go into the webinar, uh, what we have today is we have our introductions, which you know, I'm James Oliphant and Colin Abercrombie is supporting me. And we're going to go through the forces at play uh, with regards to you know, what forces there are at play in the in the accounting world today and how they're affecting you and how CRM can play a part in that story. And then on top of that, how CRM can support that story with a successful outcome. And then at the end, we'll round, that, round up those, uh, those thoughts, and then there'll be a Q&A at the end. But before I do, I really want to get an understanding from you of what, value, you know, what CRM, or what the value of CRM could bring to your business. It may be something, it may be everything. So if you could quickly all just submit your, submit your answers to this polling question, that'd be great. Okay, so let's have a look at what, what those answers are among, amongst all of you today. So looking at that, really, it's very much a case of, it's a mixed bag of results. Some of you not, have not yet developed a business case for it. Some of you have a high level understanding, which is good, um, but there are no business cases for it yet. Uh, and there's a, a few of you as well that require a, a greater understanding of CRM before you go into developing your business case, of which I hope to help you a bit on that today. And then a, a minority of you that are have also fully costed and got an ROI business case uh, for your CRM project. So congratulations to you, uh, and uh, you know that that's great to see that it's definitely a mixed bag of thoughts. But you're all thinking of CRM, and we hope today is is helpful to to you all. So what is client relationship management? Essentially, it is a technology platform for managing all of your company's relationships and also interactions with both your, your existing clients, but also your potential clients as well. And the goal is simple too. That is to improve business relationships and to increase revenues. A CRM system today can help you stay connected to, to your clients 
streamline your processes and improve your profitability. In fact, Gartner uh, predicted this year that by 2021, CRM will be the single largest revenue area for spending in enterprise software. Uh, so it's quite interesting uh, that, uh, that they've highlighted that. And we certainly as a business are seeing that uh, with all of our customers, uh, but also predominantly in the accounting sector as well. So what are the forces at play for accounting practices like yourselves? What we found that you know, amongst many, many that are in the marketplace today and many forces that are at play, we find they really boil down to, first of all, a, a digital transformation. You know, you know, for many, these changes come from the introduction of making tax digital, forcing accounting, accounting practices to look at and embrace some form of digital transformation. This in itself is a, is a huge challenge. But due to the digital era, accountants are now also faced with pressures around commoditizing their compliance services and on increasing presence and with an increase of presence of their competitors, where maybe they haven't been, these, com these competitors, due to this digital time, are not only regional, but also are now online. These same practices are faced with downward price pressures and client expectations, you know, and client, those clients' expectations changing to expect an increased value but for the same price or even less fees that they're paying today. And really a practice fit for the future means that a practice that is able to respond to all of these forces at play. Today's accounting practices are, are really looking at ways technology therefore that can act as an enabler to that required change not simply as a spreadsheet or a website to hold client prospect data or to give details about their products or services. And this is where CRM can really come in and be part of that enabler of change for a practice and be part of that new digital era. CRM can drive many benefits uh, for accounting practices and these benefits lay all around the main areas being marketing and business development. To start with and to, and to stay competitive, you need to attract and develop new clients. You need, an easy to access, you need easy access to real time data and customer insights. Essentially, you need to really improve your business development to grow new business. And CRM can really help here. And secondly, it can help you really understand your existing clients and give you the data needed to see what you have sold to them or not, this information can then support you selling more of these services to those clients and help you better engage with them on other things as well. Lastly but not leastly, CRM gives you the benefit of improving efficiencies by providing a single hub of client or prospect data, saving you money by freeing up partners and managers' times well, everyone's, everyone's time, and that time is billable time. So that, that has an immediate impact onto the revenues and to the profitability of your business. Thus, the outcomes. And for these practices that are enabling their businesses with CRM, those, these outcomes are more where they become more effective in their prospecting and cross-selling. They have a 360-degree view of all their clients, across the firm. They have improved retention of those clients as well as, and an increased spending from those clients. They have reduced time spillage. That's time spillage is time spent you know, trying to find data uh, on, a, on a particular customer, client or prospect. And Colin will go into this in a bit more detail later on, I'm sure. There's also better reporting you know, to aid their decision making processes. And what we found amongst most accountancy practices is that the potential increases in revenue lie between somewhere around 5 to 10%. So it really is quite an impact uh, on the revenues, uh, on the profit, pro profitability of your practices. 
To talk about this more in detail and, and about why they chose CRM and the experiences, I'll hand over to Colin and Abercrombie. Colin was part of the partner team at French Duncan and was instrumental in the introduction of CRM to their practice, which we worked very closely with him and his team to not only introduce CRM, but also to make it, make it a success. Colin, over to you. Thank you, James, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Before we, we kick off on, a, on my journey, I, I'd like to throw another polling question uh, to you. Uh, you indicated to James that many of you had some exposure to CRM and concept, and some of you were quite far down the line towards adoption. Uh, but it would be interesting to get a feel at this stage for what, what, the, what challenges or what worries you most uh, either before commencing such a project or as that project has developed. So if you could perhaps uh, each take a minute just to consider the choices there. Is it, is it something, data migration, if you have a, a practice that's been around for a large number of years, then having data in digital form to start with is an issue, but migrating relevant data into systems can be a, a real challenge. Uh, adoption and change management to, to deploy a CRM at the heart of your business does require a bit of a cultural shift. Um, management uh, buying in uh, and in the professional practice, that does require a significant amount of uh, partner buy-in in order for this to succeed. Resource availability and capability, who owns it? Who owns the project uh, is, is, is another key issue in what's their experience on delivering something like this. It can't really be left to IT. It's very much a, a front of house a system uh, for the, the practicing professional. And then there's the concern about delivering on time to budget and answering perhaps awkward questions from fellow partners as to where the project is uh, and, and why they haven't got the results yet. But if we look at, at uh, quickly at, at the responses, I, I see that uh, very little by way of executive sponsorship uh, as far as issues uh, concerning there, and, and nothing with regard to uh, no concerns with regard to delivery on time to budget. But uh, quite a significant uh, perceived issue on adoption and change management. I think many of you in practice probably referring to to the cultural shift uh, that would be re that requires to make CRM em embedded in a business, and perhaps the buy-in from those of us who, for whom this is not native. We didn't enter the profession with systems such as this at our disposal, and it's quite a big shift in day-to-day -day working practices to, to push us down this road. Uh, resource availability is an issue. I'll, I'll talk about that as we progress the, the chat. Uh, and Data migration, I'm surprised at how many of you underestimate that one. But uh, we can, uh, we, we'll cover them as we go. Um, we, I'll, I'll quickly run through what I'm, what I'm going to cover to give you a flavor of where, where my talk's going to go. I, and then I'll deal with each of these points in turn, and I'll return at, at various points to some of the, the issues that were highlighted there in the poll. Um, our agenda for, for growth as a practice started with identifying challenges within our practice and, and within where we wanted to go. That led to our decision to, to change our approach uh, as to how we, were go how we were going to do this. And I would stress at this point, this is purely looking at this as a business development practice growth tool and putting CRM at the heart of that. For those of you contemplating putting CRM in the form of single client view at the heart of your operational business, that is a very much larger challenge demanding significant more a uh, resource and culture change to to, uh, to succeed. And my view would be a land and expand policy here where this CRM is deployed into sales and marketing as a relatively easy win, as many of the sales and marketing team will be familiar with such platforms, and from then looking to engage culturally the professional end of the practice uh, and expand it out through that and, and involve them initially through the sales and marketing activity. But I can, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that as we go about how we, we dealt with that challenge. At the heart of this, using CRM to manage the process, I, I mean, many people will observe you can, you can affect this cultural change without CRM. You can, but you can't manage it and you can't make it visible. Uh, and CRM really is, is the heart of, of our ability to, to do that. I'll talk a little bit about execution and how we did that, uh, then how we got team buy-in, team participation, uh, down to assistant manager level in our practice. 
Um, and a little, a little bit of an overview on reporting, and then my sort of four or five takeaways if I was to do this again, maybe what I would do slightly differently. The, the challenges we identified in, in our practice, the main one was time poverty. Uh, we are all time poor, we all have a day job, uh, and that day job didn't involve rolling out CRM systems, um, although much of our time as partners was actually spent doing business development activity. Uh, and uh, what we were finding was that there was a a, a substantial uh, reluctance on the part of aspiring senior management team, or perhaps on partnership route, to devote quite as much of their private time to business development, and this was becoming an issue. A related issue to that is that a large part number of the markets that we might want to reach were not necessarily local. Uh, old forms of referral sources, banks, solicitors, etc., had dried up over the years, couldn't be relied upon to the degree that they were, particularly in the banking world. Uh, and this was leading to perhaps more time being spent in business development, but for a significantly lower return on investment if we actually chose to measure it. One of the other challenges we identified was, our, was the maintenance of consistent focus. Uh, business development tended to be a sequence of good ideas, uh, or a succession of good ideas, rather than even a sequence of good ideas uh, from partner level about what they would like to promote from within their, their technical sphere. Um, and I think that at the heart of that, as a practice, and this I think applies across the board, identify, identifying and articulating our own go-to-market. What is that go-to-market strategy? Uh, and who are our target buyers? And, and why would they choose to engage with us? I, and and you know, at the end of the day, the, the, the first point there, empower our marketing team with understanding and strategy ownership, might seem obvious to people out with the profession. Uh, but within the profession, partner groups find it very hard to let go uh, of strategy ownership, even when we know more about audit than we do about marketing. Uh, but I think the, the first step we took was to hand over the, the, the development of a strategy and the ownership of that strategy to our marketing team, who would then isolate the areas that they felt could be uh, most attractive in the marketplace. We then had to provide them with the tools to capture and develop opportunities. I'll say a bit more about that. Uh, and we wanted visibility in what the marketing team was doing, so we wanted to be able to measure and report our progress. As I, as I mentioned there, the traditional practice was, is built on rainmaking partners or senior members of the team who, are, who can be consistently relied upon to bring in work. I'm not sure that model is sustainable. Uh, we certainly didn't consider it to be so. Um, augmented with that and the traditional approach, digital assets tend to be very much in the brochure approach. Websites are there to tell people what we do as opposed to, what, as opposed to promote things that they might need. Uh, brochure uh, type uh, traditional marketing materials tend to be dictated by technical specialisms and such like, which perhaps, in our view, don't speak to the don't speak to the market uh, in the in the true sense. As I say, we had a tendency to promote what we did for a living, uh, a sort of build it and they will come model, and I don't think we were that different from any other accountancy firm in that regard. Um, as I mentioned, BD was this series of unconnected good ideas that partners would have, whether that was a golf outing or a seminar in FRS 102. Uh, I think they suffice to say the ROI in most of these ideas was pretty insignificant. Um, and there, there was a general absence of, of a strategy or a process as to where we were going to go as a business, as opposed to where each partner wanted to take their portfolio. So the decision was made to change the approach. That was made at the executive partner level, uh, to change the approach to establish who are we marketing to, where, where are the areas that we could conceivably generate growth uh, in as quick, a, a quick and a, as simple a way as possible. What is that market's pain? So if we're going to talk to a particular section of the market, what, what's identifiable to them as, as a particular issue within, within that? And what is the solution that, that we have or could develop uh, that would enable us to, to target that market um, in, a, in a focused manner. So we set about building our funnel, uh, and we handed over the management of the top half of that funnel, or the top two-thirds of that funnel, to our marketing team. The marketing team became responsible for garnering our prospect ecosystem, so uh, that would, uh, to, to, for the majority of us, that, that would be target prospects. Uh, businesses that we felt should be talking to us, 
perhaps weren't clients, but also clients where we felt we didn't have uh, perhaps the share of the wallet that, that was available, uh, and how could, how could we promote our, our services and more of our services to them in a strategic manner? Uh, because we can't always be aware of a critical event in a client's life, but we can promote uh, with a certain degree of certainty based on sectors and uh, length, of, length of time in business, etc., certain areas there. So we, we handed that over to the marketing team, uh, who developed a digital strategy around that in order to drive our prospect ecosystem further down the funnel through putting out digital content, uh, perhaps repurposing some of the content we generated day to day anyway as part of our day job. Uh, they repurposed and anonymized a, a large amount of that and utilized it with the focus on driving market qualified leads into into the funnel. And I'll, I'll, the relevance of this in the context of CRM I will come on to, but uh, the, 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 the objective here is to take things to the point where we have we, we have a population that, that we know are interested in, in certain things that we are saying before that's handed on to the professional team uh, to, to develop. And the professional team would pick those up at, at sales qualified opportunity or indeed perhaps heavily market qualified uh, opportunity to, to develop that and make contact with whether that was an existing uh, client or a, a prospect. Again, bu building the process uh, it took a little bit of time, and this is all before, of course, we resort to CRM. One of the, 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 the keys to having a successful CRM launch is really knowing what you want that CRM to hold, contain, and report. And, and until you have processes that you know and understand behind that, you're going to have great difficulty configuring a CRM uh, for your day-to-day -day purpose, and even greater difficulty explaining it to the people who weren't involved in the process and are, and are learning it once it's a, a fully-fledged entity. Uh, so I think it's key that, that you understand why within the sales and marketing uh, environment that you're, you're seeking to do this, and likewise who's responsible again for doing that. Hence, a large part of this is, is backed into the, the marketing team. You're saying to them, build us a process that will attract uh, visitors to the, or attract strangers, turn them into visitors, turn them into people who rely on us for regular communications and matters of interest or pertinence to their sector or personal life eh, or tax affairs or, or, and such like, uh, and look to convert those, as I mentioned, into MQLs before perhaps handing that over to the professional team who should then be responsible for closing that particular circle through making a direct engagement with the, with the prospect or, as I say, with an existing client. Or in, and obviously, the, the best route to more business is to delight those clients that we do have uh, but then again, make sure that we utilize these success stories and our marketing team are aware of these success stories in, in the promotion and, and generation of further business. We then move on to the, the managing of this process. We, we, we designed what we felt was a, a suitable uh, marketing approach that our marketing team could own. Um, but we, had, we then had to think about, about how we, what, what we put into that. So what was our what was our go to market? It wouldn't be one thing. We're a two hundred person firm with five offices. There were going to be several go to markets. We had to think about what those were and prioritise them, uh, and think about where we could, what realistically where the prospects of of increased growth really did lie. We could build those out as campaigns. Make sure our marketing team fully understood the technical uh, proposition that we were putting forward and could therefore promote it on our behalf. Uh, but essentially, the marketing team became the arbiters in terms of, of expressing back to us whether they thought something was sellable or not. It won't surprise many of you to know that audit didn't rank very highly uh, as far as the go-to-market strategy was concerned, uh, whereas perhaps an outsource uh, specialism that we had did. Uh, and again, it was all down to what, what did that market have to offer, what did we have to offer that market, and how quickly could we get growth there. We designed the CRM around those principles that I have just covered, including the, the, the go-to-market strategy. So the CRM was effectively reverse engineered to allow us to manage that process. We segmented the existing client base and brought in, at this stage, only those clients that we felt were relevant in the CRM environment. We didn't seek to push the whole client base into the CRM. The data cleanse work that that would require would have been significant. Um, and slowed down uh, the deployment of, of, uh, of the CRM engine. We imported contact data on conquest targets, so we looked both 
We've had the marketing team looking at the market and establishing right, who should be in our prospect ecosystem. We also had conquest targets that partners had in the little black book that they felt they'd been trying to win for a while. Um, and we put those in. And the other data source we put into this strategy at the beginning is, was our bank of referral sources, the banks and solicitors who were active friends of the firm, making sure that we didn't just put in every bank and solicitor, but making sure, of course, that these were actually active friends of the firm and could be worked in a manner and marketed to in a manner that would allow them to, to you know, allow us to develop them as champions. Within this, obviously, we have the stages that we set out. There's the awareness and consideration stage, and we felt the marketing team should take ownership of that whole awareness piece, pushing you know, to, the, to the chosen markets. Uh, thought leadership pieces on LinkedIn, so a lot of the, this was they would take, take ownership of the LinkedIn site for certain partners in terms of postings, Twitter pages, etc. push content out through those, uh, and try and get us into the consideration stage where we where our target market was aware of us and was actively perhaps considering us and something they may be doing, and the professional team could then pick this up. So none of that, you'll note so far, has really, other than mentioning the acronym every now and then, uh, really touched in CRM. But what I would add, I'd like to ask another poll question at this point uh, before I go into how CRM has helped us, and really just ask all of you, what, what visibility do you come to have on, on all of your practice or your organization's referrals or potential sale opportunities? Um, and how easy do you find that information to come by? Uh, would you say no visibility, unless it was your, your own pipeline? Uh, some visibility, or would some of you say, well, no, this is something I, I'm able to see all of? But as I say, one of the fundamental reasons for us um, deploying a CRM is to give us exactly that visibility and, and of management and control. If uh, you're already in a practice or a business where you feel you have full visibility and control of that, then there'll be limits to what a CRM can deliver. Whereas if you have no visibility in this and no visibility across a partnership on what anybody is spending budget on and the success of that, then perhaps that's something we should be considering as we, as we develop uh, our, our system. So, very few, uh, very few people reporting that they have visibility on all, uh, and not surprisingly, mo most of us, but I think, would say we have visibility on some. We all hear about the um, the things that are happening. If it's uh, anecdotally, if it's anything like our practice, you hear about the things that are going well, uh, and you hear less about the things that are not being developed at all or have perhaps fallen by the wayside. Uh, and again, a, a fundamental core of, of CRM would be to surface all of that information. So in, in addressing the, the visibility issue that, that uh, we've, we've covered there in our poll, uh, how would CRM uh, assist in that? As I mentioned, the data set that's in the CRM will include existing clients or a portion thereof, targets, target markets, target sectors, and I would urge anyone to do research there and look at exactly what they were what they wanted in that data set, and don't just go to a data warehouse and buy a whole load of businesses with a turnover of between 10 and 150 million in the local geography. You'll simply flood your data set with a, with a whole lot of businesses that you won't be talking to uh, at any point in the near future. Keep it, keep it neat, keep it tidy, keep it manageable, uh, and, and be specific about what those targets are. Um, the reason for that, at some point in their journey, they're going to be assigned to a member of the professional team to be developed. Um, and it's, this is much this operates much more effectively through the CRM medium uh, if we have a finite population to deal with. And as I mentioned, the data set should also include referral sources. But what the CRM, if you look at the the the, uh, the illustrations to the left, the infographic to the left on that slide, you'll note that the CRM enables us to do a number of things. It enables us to nurture this pipeline, and nurture nurture the activity with, with each of these contacts. Make sure that if we have friends of the firm in terms of referral sources, that somebody is is appointed within the firm for for the management of that relationship. Making sure that if we have target markets, that those are being developed, uh, specifically with target uh, corporates corporates on the other side and contacts within them, and making sure that our existing clients, where we feel we are not providing the, all the services that they they should be looking at. Um, making sure that, that we are nurturing that in the pipeline. So this, the pipeline will depend very much on your go-to-market and what you feel those campaigns should be. 
what, what a good CRM will then enable you to do is surface all the activity in relation to that, those campaigns. So whether that is blogging activity, email marketing campaigns, bashful sequences, which is really just a, a, a more personal approach to, to direct marketing. Uh, search engine optimization, so making sure that we're, we're designing the website in a manner that's getting traffic and monitoring that website traffic through the CRM, who's been on our website, what pages have they been on, how long have they been there. Uh, if the individuals in question are known within the CRM, then they, through the URL you will get information that they have, they have transited across the website. Uh, it's just then what, what we choose to, to do with that information. Uh, I would urge everyone to develop landing pages within their website that you can t you can push people to uh, through your marketing, your whether it's email marketing or, or blogging or through LinkedIn uh, links. But take try and take people to these landing pages. We did that very successfully, uh, and it did lead uh, to significant uh, amounts of, of additional work through driving people to landing pages, we were able to capture their information in gateways if they were looking to download a white paper or a thought leadership piece that we had posted within the website, they would have to fill in a gateway to access that. We would then capture a little bit of information about them and then able and we're then able to focus our marketing in a more personal manner to them because we have an awareness of, of what may be of interest to them and, and escalate that through the, the, the pipeline. Uh, as we develop that. So I think landing pages, I would say people, you know, if you look at the average CA firm that I have looked at uh, in this this field, the websites run to hundreds of pages. Uh, most of it there for a very good reason, I'm sure, but very little of it actually there providing a business development tool. And I, and I think that's the area where I'm not saying for a minute anybody should throw out their existing website, but they should look to see whether it's actually there for its fundamental modern purpose, which is to get traffic driven to it and and have, a, and have a means within that when they get there of capturing that information. And likewise, there's a few other areas where the CRM would provide significant uh, advantages, marketing automation, so you're able to, to de derive the benefits of setting up email sequences over time or capturing leads as they visit websites and such like and bringing those into the CRM and, and, and pushing them through for action. Uh, and also, as a matter close to all of our hearts, I'm sure compliance and, and in particular GDPR, I, a good CRM will provide you with a platform for making sure you are recording why you believe you are GDPR compliant in each and every step you take on this route. Uh, and that is important, um, it's regardless of whether these are existing clients or, or, or potential clients, it's important that we do have a means of documenting why we believe we're justified in marketing to them. So overall, the, the CRM at the heart of this would be the central platform for determining and initiating action. What are we, do, what are we going to do and, and, and who are we going to, to, to do that action towards? Monitoring the outcomes. Was this, was this email blast successful? Was it not? Did we get a take up? Did we not? Uh, and, and driving movement down the pipeline or movement in the data. You, you want to see these contacts uh, and targets moving forwards uh, in the pipeline and to do that, someone has to take responsibility from, from progressing a, a target list from just being a wish list of companies we wished we act for to one where we've actually driven them to some form of relationship with the business. Uh, and we did that through CRM deployment and empowering the marketing team to take ownership of, of that piece. When we get beyond that, the, and, and the marketing team have, have fulfilled their bit and they've, they've driven uh, traffic further down the, the, the sales funnel, it then becomes the, the, the professional team's responsibility to pick those up and they would be assigned generally on a technical uh, expertise basis. So if, if someone had downloaded a white paper on inheritance tax planning, then it would be logical that our inheritance tax expert was the one engaged to follow up on that particular contact. It does require that everyone is coordinated in this uh, and understands what's being asked of them uh, from a professional side. It does go against the grain. Some of you mentioned in the earlier poll there about change of approach and culture change, and that is a big culture change uh, where we are out hunting as salesmen uh, as opposed to waiting on nice warm uh, introductions from referral sources. But that is the modern world, I'm afraid, and we've really got to engage in a 
fit for purpose sales strategy. And we need to align our team to that. The team need to understand why we're doing it, why we're adopting this approach. We set KPIs for our team. So they had KPIs in the form of, for example, if we had friends of the firm in our referral source bank, they would be assigned a relationship manager. That relationship manager would be KPI'd on developing that uh, that referral source. Now, obviously, the mo at the most basic level, that means keeping in touch, uh, seeing them for a coffee or a lunch or, or engaging them on the phone. Uh, but we worked on the basis if those interactions weren't recorded within the CRM, then they hadn't been undertaken. Therefore, you hadn't fulfilled your KPI. Now, you can, you can derive any number of KPIs that you think are relevant to your business and your go-to-market strategy. But it is vitally important in order to, to if you're going to have them, that, that they're measurable. That, that they, I mean, there's a really very little point in measuring professionals on sales outcomes. Uh, really, all they can generally control is their activity in the pursuit of, of new business. The strategy should be determining how and what they're doing in that regard. And, and the KPIs should be measuring whether they're doing the, that to the level that you wanted them to. Uh, and that falls very neatly into the linking BD to outcomes. So, are we getting an ROI on this investment? Um, you know, how much how much of what we're spending is actually resulting in new business, and it becomes measurable and monitor and monitorable. The CRM will link, for example, referral good referral sources that we have spent time and effort working with. We can relate any new business wins into that referral source within the CRM. Uh, and at a glance, we can take a view of that referral source as a continued friend of the firm based on the activity with us, and that will be surfaced through their, their page within the CRM. We can assign responsibilities, as I've mentioned. We can set close dates that tie into people's diaries. So, for example, developing a, a pipeline lead target beyond, uh, let's say we had them as a, a marketing qualified lead. They've been on the website. They've downloaded some content. A member of the technical team was charged with making, making direct contact with them and, and arranging to see them, and we would put a close date on that, and then we would expect to be report a report back as to how that had gone. The report back would come through the CRM so that we could surface all of our actions uh, and our progress through the interface of the CRM. This next slide is, is not designed for, for people to take in everything on it, uh, but it's just to give you a flavour of how we reported all of this activity. Um, we can report by target account in terms of who was responsible for developing that target account. We can report on referral sources and how much business we're getting or not getting from them and who's managing that relationship. We can report by individual within the practice in terms of new business generated or cross-sell business generated. Uh, and all of this obviously stems from KPIs that we would have set for them aligned to a strategy that we as a business felt we should be pursuing. And that's very much the way we did it. Those dashboards could be surfaced in, in PDF forum to partners or on, da or on phones or tablets to the managing partner should he wish to look into what exactly we're we getting for our, for our spend on any particular activity. So if we are, again, if we were aligning a campaign to grow a certain section of our business, we would have a a campaign dashboard that, that indicated how successful or otherwise that was uh, and how much money we had spent uh, on doing that. If I was to leave you with, with any, any thoughts on this that, that uh, I think would perhaps aid your own journey uh, on it, I, I think I probably should have mentioned at the start of this talk, I have deployed CRM twice within a practice. I deployed it entirely throughout my own practice. So we used it for a single client view, and it, it covered all operational activity, all emails in and out of the business, all, phone, all, all phones were dialed from, from it. So we had a record that a phone call had been made, et cetera, et cetera, to a huge level of detail. That's a massive job to implement at that level in a fully functioning, a mature practice, and I wouldn't recommend anybody try that. I think the way to do this is to deploy, as I mentioned, deploy CRM within the rather friendly environment of marketing. Um, and that's exactly what we did at French Duncan. As I mentioned, the, the takeaways I've, I've put here, I think, first of all, why are you doing this? If you're putting it in as a marketing tool, what are you looking to grow? Which bit of the business are you looking to grow and develop? And I think that needs to be centered around what, where do you 
perceive a market need as opposed to what skills do we necessarily have and if it involves reskilling then that's perhaps something that needs to be to be thought about. Build a prospect ecosystem. Who are you actually who who is that market? Who's in it? If you have a go to market, it's essential you know who's in that market and, and get the content of that market into your CRM and align campaigns against that within your CRM. For existing clients, isolate the cross-sell opportunities. So again, I would urge only to perhaps put the, the clientele that you would reckon we, there, are, there will be cross-sell opportunity with within the CRM. At French Duncan, we had oh, 36,000 records, contact records, uh, that we could have pushed into the CRM. Probably only two or 3,000 of those would be relevant from a cross-sell opportunity point of view. There's no sense in making the data management project 10 times harder. Uh, and slowing down your, your growth opportunities. That's something that could be done at a later date if indeed you did want everybody, uh, all clients surfaced in the CRM. I think importantly, empower the marketing team to market the business, to know and understand what the market requires and needs, uh, and to perhaps give guidance on, you know, is a seminar in FRS 102 really going to be well attended? They, will, uh, they, they require to be, to be empowered, to be honest with you, uh, in terms of what they think will succeed and what they think will go away, and not just implement the professional practitioner's ideas uh, with regards to, to events and such like. And as I mentioned, and as James mentioned in his talk, I think the critical part here uh, is that you measure, report, and manage all of this in CRM dashboards, giving you visibility. That, that's all from me, uh, and I'm going to hand you back to, to Naila. Thank you. Many thanks, James and Colin. We will now address a few of your questions. Um, in terms of an end-to-end -end timeline for implementation to get the CRM up and running from the first sort of conversation, what are you looking at? Uh, in terms of how long it might take? I think from a, Colin may have a different view, but James there, typically we, there's various routes which you can take and there's no simple answer to, to that question. It is a very good one though. And it really depends like, like what Colin said on how you wish to uh, look and take on CRM. For instance, we have a, a sort of CRM for success for accounting, which is a out of the box as much as you can implementation, which delivers around marketing and business development around a pre-built and pre-configured uh, database. And that, that you're looking at sort of six to eight weeks uh, from the point of you know, from the point of starting. And that's around a lot of onboarding, training, training and enablement. Uh, but if you're looking for something that's not particularly unique or, or, or non-standard and you're wanting to do a bit of a, a more bespoke implementation, then those those deployments can take uh, any, you know, any number of weeks depending on you know, the, the level and the extent of the development that you're looking to do. So yeah. on that point, James, Oh, sorry, Colin, go ahead. Yeah, I would, I would agree with, with, with what James has said there. I, I think the, uh, I would, and I would encourage people to go the, the simple route and, and take a route into CRM that enables quick deployment rather than yeah. over-engineering it. As accountants, we can very quickly get caught up in the detail of this and what's not in it. And what's not in it isn't actually that important. It's what we get in, get into it early on. And that's why I'm saying focus on a finite data set, uh, and that will rapidly speed up the deployment of your CRM. Thanks, Colin. So what I was going to ask as a follow-up question to that is, are there different levels of CRM system um, or a maximum level of leads that it can handle? Uh, and so would you be looking at implementing a certain level of system that aligns with your firm's needs? Um, in, in essence, no. I mean, the, the all uh, as soon as you implement CRM, it depends on who you choose. Uh, various different levels, various different companies out there have different levels of licensing and, and make it very complex in terms of 
you know, when people look at systems of what license they should they should take. And I think that's one of the also one of the positives and one of the reasons Colin chose workbooks. And Colin, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but is our simple approach to our uh, to our licensing. And this is a bit more of a product answer. Um, but our licensing has the whole access to the product. So you don't need to increase licensing later on. The only time you need to increase is when you add more people on. So there is no there is no limit to the amount of data or people or organizations you can put into a single system. Yeah, I would, I would echo that, James. I think the, the workbook system itself is a hugely powerful and very deep CRM. It does it does a lot more and is capable of a lot more than, than CRM and automated marketing. Uh, and I think that that for I, I would just, I can't think of any any professional practice that would say that that there's not something in there or there's something missing from that with regards to what I would look to do from a, a sort of service support point of view. It will support that again. I would encourage people not to start there, but um, but but I think it, the level of complexity will be dictated by whoever the project owner is, uh, and they'll just have to allow themselves longer. To, to, to based on how complex and how deep they want to go in their organisation. Okay, Colin, um, you talked about deploying the CRM system via the marketing team, but is is it worth considering uh, bringing in someone from outside specifically to look after CRM, whether on a full time or part time basis? to assist the marketing team in sort of bringing this to fruition? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. Uh, and, uh, and and I'm going to give a very strange answer to it because it's not really a CRM uh, assistant that you're looking for. The first hire I would make is to hire a data controller or find someone in your team. And I, and I don't mean someone that will do this at evenings and weekends. The data in the professional practices, we are drowning in a sea of it. We've got more of it than we know what to do with. Uh, and when we try and surface it in a CRM, uh, our, our absence of management of that data will become obvious. And this is where you know, having someone that you can set the data tasks to, because data build is, is complex, it's difficult, it's time consuming. And the last thing you want your marketing team is explaining we've got no new business this quarter because we're build, busy building a data set. So uh, I, that's, that is the bit I would offload. Okay, so that would be a data controller and not uh, a tech person. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay, well, that's all we've got time for in terms of questions. Apologies to those of you whose questions we didn't get time to address. We will try to follow up with those offline. That concludes today's webinar. I'd like to thank James and Colin for their insight and advice, and I'd also like to thank you, our listeners, for your time and for your questions. I hope you found the session useful. You can access a short feedback survey by clicking on the survey widget at the bottom of your page. Please, please do complete this as your feedback is really important to us and helps us to shape future events. The webinar has been recorded and we'll send you a link to the on-demand recording later today. Thank you and goodbye.